Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. I hope those who are not joining us in this room in the auditorium have the opportunity to watch this on Channel 95. We have a lot of important information to go over during this time that I think is very good for all residents to see. So we'll have this replaying as we have done up until now with the PowerPoint that you've seen, the presentation. And then please review it. And please see Marty if you'd like a copy. Barnabas, as you may or may not know, is still on active duty. So he is helping many, many people in the state of Florida as they move to whatever their new normal is going to be and to help with the rebuilding. We do believe he's going to back, be back here in about another week, so we'll keep you posted. In the meantime, it's my pleasure to have George Bryan, our vice president for our regional, off, our <laughs> regional area. You're going to give us an office down here, George, um, to do our prayer and to do the presentation. Thank you, George. Thank you. So would you join me in prayer? Um, I'll, I'll be praying in my tradition. I, I invite you to join me in yours. I'll use this one so I don't have to swallow this one. Is that better? Okay, please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gorgeous day you've given us and the blessings that we have to serve in your name and walk in your steps. We ask that you keep those that are troubled comforted and protect Barnabas and those um, other special caregivers and providers that are reaching out and extending offers of help um, for those that are in trouble. We also ask that you watch over this world that we're in. It is a troubling world now, and we know that your hand is over it, and there is purpose. We thank you for this gathering today and ask for the, the wisdom and your guidance in absorbing what we learn and use it to improve. Um, in your name we pray, amen. Now, first, I'm sure there are hundreds and hundreds of you at home watching <laughs> as I'm speaking to a lot of chairs and thankful for the residents that are here today. Um, and I just wanted to, just a, an advertisement, there's nothing like being here. So when you can make it to a town hall, it is an opportunity for a live dialogue and there's a different synergy in the room. There's nothing also for some like the comfort of home, and maybe you're still in your PJs. Um, but I do want to just make sure I've, I talked to a few residents who just expressed to me the importance also of being able to gather at these occasions. Um, next, I want to thank you for your flexibility. Um, this is at least the third attempt to schedule this meeting. And the, the final issue obviously was um, Hurricane Ian and its impact that it had um, on the west coast of Florida. Now, you may already know that your community was prepared. Um, you had all, we have a system that's, that has a lot of little checks to check off, and each department has a, a pre-existing list of, of responsibilities. That was underway. You also had staff members who stayed here monitoring the conditions that could have easily um, dissolved quickly um, with trouble. Um, thankfully, that did not happen. You also may recall from the past that when storms um, are approaching us, the, one of the benefits of ACTS and the size of the organization is that we have a response team. We call it the community assistance team, and there are pre-identified individuals with expertise in different areas, most of them revolving around logistics and real estate, generator power, cleanup, et cetera. They were actually positioned um, and waited in Jacksonville until the storm really finalized its path because they didn't want to get stuck on the wrong side of the storm if it were to turn. So in other words, if it would have made a curve towards the panhandle, they didn't want to get caught on the wrong side. Um, they did move down closer to Indian River Estates um, during the storm and were on site for the storm. And a second team then was in the mid-south mid region waiting for the, the storm because, it, as you know, it went out in the Atlantic and back in. And while it turned into a rain event, 
Um, flood waters, you know, are the number one killers of storms. And also even light winds in areas that don't experience a lot of winds have downed trees, power lines, so the aftermath which sometimes is much more difficult to manage than the storm itself. So all those were in place. Indian River States did lose power for about 13 hours um, from 1 o'clock in the morning until about 2, 2.30 the next day. Um, of course, it always happens at night, and hurricanes always seem to hit us at night. We, well, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, but we did recover quickly. Um, Florida Power and Light was there and able to recover the community, and, and really there was more cleanup, very little water damage. That first wave that came through Palm Beach County was uh, the worst that even the, that community felt, with the exception of about a 3 a.m. Um, wind that came through. And it, it really cut not too far north of the county, of Indian River County, um, so a close call. And we can see what the devastation can do from a direct hit on the coastline, which is important to remember, on the coastline, for a category four, close to category five. But I, I just wanted to leave you, hopefully with the comfort to know that you're never alone, that there's an army of AXE employees ready to assist. And if the community would have some level of significant impact, I can assure you that all hands on deck would be the call and we would get assistance from all across AXE and obviously governmental sources, et cetera, but, but we're very self-contained when it comes to these types of events. But it did lead us to rescheduling the meeting, so thank you. Um, the video has been playing. I'm going to play it now again for us. It's a short one, it's 20 minutes, um, but it has a lot of information about what we've been managing, the challenges from the financial um, issues that the nation and the world are experiencing, how we've been managing those, um, and also a glimpse at some of the challenges in, in the 2023 budget preparations, which are very unique, as you can only imagine, given the circumstances with the economy. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start our video. Hello, I'm Karen Christensen, president of AXE. I, along with other members of senior management, had the pleasure of visiting every AXE community over the past few months, which provided the opportunity to meet with community leadership and resident association leadership. A consistent theme was concern over current economic conditions, including inflation and the labor crisis. The impact of these conditions on the AXE organization and how we are responding is on the minds of most, if not all of you. So today, it is my pleasure to be joined by Jeremy Neely, Senior Vice President of Community Operations, and Deirdre Gronin, Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer, and to present the September Town Hall meeting, weathering the economic storm with a focus on workforce management. We will provide an overview of the current challenges that have the most impact on our organization, describe what those impacts are and how we are addressing these challenges, again, with a focus on the workforce. In our 50 year history, we have been through many types of storms, economic and otherwise, all of which have various impacts on our organization and all of which we have successfully weathered the challenges of today include high inflation, a labor crisis, and the continuance of the pandemic. Each of these is a challenge on its own. Certainly, experiencing them at the same time is a challenge we have never experienced before. But no matter the intensity or the length of the storm, we will successfully navigate it together. Let's start with inflation. Certainly, the level of inflation and its impact on the economy is one of the hottest topics right now. AXE has been fortunate to have been operating through three decades of inflation between 2 to 3 percent. So it is concerning as we see inflation increasing so quickly. However, as an organization, we have weathered high inflationary periods before including a 50-year high of over 13% back in 1979. Inflation we are experiencing today is largely driven by the rise in food and energy costs. With this rise in inflation, 
it is of great comfort that we have some short-term protections against these rising prices, as many of our goods and services are under previously negotiated lower cost contracts. This is one of the advantages of the Act's purchasing power with 26 communities spread across nine states. However, as these contracts come up for renewal, we are experiencing the impact of rising prices, especially in the areas of food, utilities, and supplies. Please know that with each contract renewal, we are responsibly and strategically negotiating the terms, including the duration of the contract, given the current high inflationary period. Inflation is also putting pressure on an already difficult labor market. In addition to these being unprecedented and uncertain times, it is also an unusual time, as not since the 1970s has the inflation rate been above unemployment. Generally, as a nation, industry, and organization, we haven't had significant wage pressure in recent times, since unemployment had been running slightly ahead of base unemployment of 5 to 5.2% and inflation was very low. But today it is the exact opposite, which puts pressure on wages. Wage pressure also goes beyond just inflationary impacts as supply and demand has changed significantly since the pandemic. Last year, we talked about the great resignation where the pandemic was causing record high quit rates amongst workers. This year, the challenge is referred to as the great retirement, as the pandemic has caused a spike in the number of baby boomers leaving the workforce as they choose to spend more time with family, friends, and traveling. The pandemic has certainly impacted our lives and our organization in many ways. When we were administering vaccinations in late 2020 and early 2021, never did I think we would experience two separate periods of surging cases. In addition to impacting our health and safety, the continuance of the pandemic continues to negatively impact the supply of workers, particularly healthcare workers. Exacerbating the workforce challenges are the continuance of COVID-related regulations regarding isolation protocols specific to healthcare workers. Jeremy will now provide more specifics on how the continuance of the pandemic in a period of high inflation during a national labor crisis is impacting our organization. Thank you, Karen. These are truly uncertain and unprecedented times. But as previously mentioned, Axe has successfully weathered every storm in its path, and I'm certain this will be no different. The global workforce challenges have impacted Axe in a variety of ways. Some would say that our line of business is a very complex one. We employ individuals from a variety of fields, which complicates our recruiting efforts. Consider a CCRC. We compete with hospitals because we employ caregivers and clinicians. We compete with restaurants because we employ cooks, servers, and utility workers. We compete with school districts because we employ drivers to operate our fleet of vehicles. We compete with hotels and other hospitality-based organizations because we employ environmental services and maintenance staff. With this significant competition and less workforce supply, we have seen an increase in our employee turnover levels. Our strategic target is to maintain turnover at 15% or less. Pre-pandemic, we were very close at 16%. Today, that has grown to over 25%. As turnover increases, this certainly interrupts service delivery and increases our costs. As a service organization, our largest expense category is salary, wages, and benefits, representing 60% of total expenses. Due to intertwined factors, inflation, national labor crisis, and the continuance of the pandemic, workforce management will continue to be a challenge. Here is how these challenges specifically impact ACTS. 
I will start with culinary services because this is the one service that most residents interact with on a daily basis. Wage inflation has had a tremendous impact on our culinary services. As our competitors increase wages and offer incentives for new recruits, our cost for labor has naturally increased. Due to this inflation, communities have had to augment dining services to address the increasing demand and shrinking supply of workers. At your local community, these challenges present themselves as changes to your customary dining. For instance, some communities have and will continue to offer buffets, or some may limit the number of tables seated at a time. Thank you for your patience as we make these adjustments. The second and arguably the most significant labor and financial challenge is the cost of contracted staff. Contracted staff, such as agency nurses, are not AX employees. During the pandemic, many nurses and clinicians left the field for a variety of reasons. Some were afraid of the unknown as it relates to COVID-19. Others had childcare challenges and needed the flexibility to work from home, while others opted to work for agencies where they could demand escalated rates. This created many vacancies in our Willowbrook Court and Oak Ridge Terrace staffing schedules. Unfortunately, the vacancies had to be filled the following ways, with existing staff working overtime, community clinical leaders working the floor, and as a last resort, utilizing staffing agencies who charge a premium. As you can imagine, this volume of agency staffing is not sustainable for many reasons. Most importantly, we do not want our dedicated and loyal clinicians to burn out, so we are working diligently to fill the vacancies by ramping up our recruiting efforts. Deidre will share some of those efforts shortly. It is also important to understand that our staff often lose productive time as isolation rules continue to exist for those who have been exposed to or infected by COVID-19. Given the highly transmissible BA5 variant, exposures are still common and isolation periods can be lengthy, causing greater than expected utilization for overtime and agency staffing. Given the current state of the pandemic, including vaccinations, treatments, and new variants that cause less severe illness, a number of policies have and will continue to be updated, consistent with newly released CDC guidance, which will assist in easing some of the staffing pressures. The third, and for many residents, the most visible impact of these challenges is on the execution of our community capital plans. As many of you are aware, X has a very detailed and robust five-year capital planning process. We go to great lengths to evaluate the life of equipment and anticipate replacement, as well as plan for community renovation projects. When combining inflation with supply chain issues, we're having to make adjustments to the extent, scope, and timing of capital projects, as bids for these projects are coming in well over original projections. Given that certain projects occur over an extended period of time, we are also being prudent in not entering into too many new contracts during these periods of extreme volatility. Please continue to be patient as we make adjustments to the plans. We will continue to be transparent with our plans with the understanding that given the current economic environment, plans are subject to change. As I close this section of the presentation, I am pleased to highlight one of the true strengths and blessings of the Axe organization, financial protection to our residents supported by our financial health. As we've continued to face rising costs, we've experienced a negative operating margin. But given our financial strength, leveraging our strong balance sheet that includes almost $2 billion in assets and over $100 million of positive net assets, we've been able to absorb a temporary unexpected increase in expenses, preventing a second monthly fee increase or the need to pass along a current year assessment to residents. We are aware of other organizations increasing monthly fees outside of the normal adjustments to meet financial challenges. We are not doing that and are pleased to be able to shield our residents as much as possible from the effects of high inflation. 
It should also be noted that while our operating margin is currently negative, that is only one financial metric. More importantly, other financial metrics such as debt service coverage and days cash on hand remain strong and aligned with budget expectations. I've shared the impact that inflation, the national labor crisis, and the pandemic is having on our organization. It is my pleasure to introduce Deirdre to share the many steps we are taking to mitigate the challenges. Thank you, Jeremy. Certainly, the combination of inflation, unemployment, the pandemic, the great resignation, and great retirement are having a profound impact on the workforce. Most specifically with labor rates, especially across earners whose hourly rate is less than $20 an hour. By way of example, specific to food preparation and service occupations, these average rates across the country are increasing at up to 10%. Fortunately, a few years ago, ACTS created the ACTS Living Wage that provided adjustments to those with wages less than $15 an hour. Since the pandemic, we have also increased pay ranges and current wages for certain positions in response to the labor crisis. As such, in addition to normal wage increases, we have made market rate and compression rate adjustments where and as needed to remain competitive and fair to our valued staff. We have been creative in our recruitment and retention efforts as we strive to offer services at the same level as pre-pandemic and do appreciate your patience as community leadership makes temporary adjustments as required by both resident expectations as well as staffing levels. We continue to review and focus on our pay rates and shift differentials for our clinical staff to adjust where needed to assure our competitive position, which will also help to eliminate the use of agency nursing. Sign-on bonuses have been utilized based on community need when roles have been posted for a long period of time without successful hiring. We also recognize that there are other factors beyond pay that are important in recruitment and retention strategies. As such, we are updating job titles and job descriptions to ensure they are consistent with market trends. We are also exploring opportunities to provide more flexibility in schedules and will continue to invest in benefits, including training and education. Our nurse preceptor program has been initiated to recruit and train new or less experienced nurses. To assist with the challenge related to capital projects, we've created an AXE construction division that is in place at many of our communities, and we look forward to expanding this to more communities in the near future. Human Resources has also partnered with operations to create a rapid response workforce task force. This task force has been created to help community executive directors recruit new staff to fill all positions, with a focus on nursing staff so we can eliminate the practice of using agency nursing. We are engaging with new and unique partners created as an alternative to agencies, and we are attracting and converting these individuals to employees after a short time. In addition, we have a healthcare staffing task force that has been created to review and implement staffing programs specific to those settings, such as offering special hours and shift coverage programs. Finally, we've improved our onboarding of new staff, including reduced pre-employment screening and testing requirements where state law supports this new practice. One of the recruitment opportunities can benefit you. You too can help. As residents, if you know anyone you would like to see work at ACTS, encourage them to join our family. Please visit your community business office to complete a referral form and have that person apply at our job site, www.axe-jobs.org. You can earn a one-time $500 referral bonus credited towards your monthly fee if your referral joins the Axe family. Thank you, Deirdre. And thanks to you and our human resources team for all your efforts in helping work through these unique and challenging times. As Deirdre shared, a lot of efforts are taking place to assist our executive directors and their teams with recruiting, onboarding, and retaining our workforce. As we focus on our workforce and we increase wages, we will continue to work towards reducing additional costs for outsourced labor, such as agency nursing. And as we experience inflationary increases, particularly in the areas of food, insurance, and utilities, 
we will remain focused on efforts to lessen and offset the impact on our financial performance and budget projections. This presentation has been our third resident town hall for 2022. Please look for an invitation from your executive directors where he or she and your regional vice president will invite you to attend a live question and answer session hosted by them to answer any questions you may have regarding this presentation. In addition, your executive director will share some local actions he or she and the team are taking at the community level to mitigate the labor shortages, including recruitment. We are also happy to announce that we will soon be sending you our biannual resident survey and encourage you to participate in that survey. Thank you, Jeremy and Deirdre, and thank you for watching this town hall presentation. While this presentation focused on today's conditions, we understand that residents are also interested and concerned about what will happen in 2023. We are currently in the late stages of our budget planning process, which is certainly one of the more, if not most, difficult to complete. There remains great uncertainty as to what the economic conditions will be over the next 16 months. Will the economy go into recession? Will inflation subside? Will unemployment increase? Will the labor crisis ease? Will the pandemic conditions improve? We are working hard to develop a budget that can be flexible in responding to the changing conditions that will likely be present throughout next year. While I cannot make any announcements or predictions yet on the monthly fee increase, please know that like every year, no matter what the financial challenge, we don't place the burden solely on the backs of our residents. We are working very hard and creatively to balance a budget that is fair to both residents and employees while utilizing and maintaining the financial strength of this great organization. Thank you again for your trust, partnership, and support. May God continue to bless you and the entire Axe family. Okay, um, a lot of information and a lot of details as to what's going on behind the scenes today to control expenses for this year but it's important to also understand the impact that it has on planning for the budget next year. So in other words, if we can't really get a definitive answer from a recruitment and a labor and turnover perspective, it plays into the planning for next year. So I can't overstate the efforts that are going on daily. I'm actually invited to a multitude of meetings that are community specific and, and regional and corporate in nature, all for the purpose of looking for opportunities to support communities in their unique efforts because every community, every county, every state has its different challenges, so they vary. I can proudly share, and I, and I don't want to take anything away from what Robin will be sharing, but I can proudly share that in the southeast region, we, have, we started actually in November of last year in an effort to focus on recruitment. And we have had some agency, but very, very limited compared to other regions and some challenges they had. And this is a very competitive area. So I, it's really, I attribute it to, the, to an early start and, an, and recognizing the challenge ahead and also the, the continued efforts of the communities, the staff, um, and the region in supporting that effort. So, and it started long ago to help get to where we are today. That being said, we're all in the Axe family together. Other regions are having challenges for different reasons. Um, they're also insulated from challenges that we have outside of labor. For example, if a hurricane did impact us, the cost of that hurricane would be borne on the organization overall, not on a specific community. So we're all in this together as an obligated group. You've heard that term before. Those are the, I believe it's 21 communities now that make up that collective obligated group. There were a couple of other efforts that you feel, one specifically that's talked about that you feel and may have an opinion about, but I wanted to tie it to efforts so that you're aware of the reason. And that's the talk about in the effort to go to a paperless newsletter, so to have the electronic newsletter. 
Um, and another, another paper, we have it in, it's, it's actually in a, from an expense perspective, it falls in paper, but it could be plastic, but it's this takeout containers. When you have takeout or take something out from the dining room or the bistro, um, collectively as an organization, actually half step back, the takeout. You know the green clamshells, the going green, we actually purchased those company-wide during the pandemic because all of a sudden, because we were dining and you're delivering to your home, our paper account just went crazy. And then supply and demand, the cost of that also went up. So we had to control those expenses. The reality is, you know, now that we're accustomed to using those, and it's not the easiest. That means behind the scenes, we're having to wash them. They have to air dry, so they're, which takes space and time. So there's a labor component, but there's a huge um, quantifiable savings in paper supplies or plastic by going to those green clamshells. Right now, we're very close to pulling the trigger on going to that now and the expectation of cutting our paper budget down next year to be able to help control any increases that you would have. Now, between the two, between the newsletter and the, those clamshells going green, these are George's calculations, but it's well in excess of half a percent. So by doing that, we're able to take a controllable expense because we can't control everything. We can't control Florida Power and Light's charges to us. We can't control some of the cost of, of labor is actually industry driven. There are a lot of things we can't control of your monthly maintenance fee increase. You know, that I, I just, in my rough calculations, that number is roughly about $1.2 million as a company if we go green with those clamshells and also um, go to digital newsletters. I do want to acknowledge that not everyone has access to a computer. Um, not everyone is really comfortable using that to look at their newsletter. So we understand that there's a, we need to bridge that gap I've been approached by residents who say, I have a computer, I can read it online, I don't want to, I'm willing to pay for that newsletter. So we understand, and that's all that we're trying to work on and, and, and resolve now, is meeting the needs of, of everyone. We have other residents that are very comfortable using their iPad or what have you to read literature and look at their newsletter. But the reality is, it is a controllable expense. So anything, and that's an example of many areas that we're looking at to say, what can we do proactively um, to be able to save dollars this year and get ready now, not talk about it and implement it next year, but actually get it in place this year so that we can realize those savings going into next year, which otherwise would be dollars you know, that we would need to spend that impact um, our expenses, which impacts your monthly maintenance fees. So a couple of snapshots I just wanted to share it's, it's, again, I can't, there's no way to overstate what's going on to be creative given the circumstances that are outside of our control. The world market's outside of our control. But you saw OPEC yesterday, they're cutting 2 million barrels a day in production. So right when we see our energy costs going down, you know, a tweak, you know, they saw, I, the one I saw is a guy turning off a spigot. <laughs> And, and there they go back up. We can't control that, but what we can do, there are some things we can control, and that's what we're focused on, and, and just being as conservative as we can. We have a question. I'll repeat it. Your question? She did not, yes, she did not say that we don't depend on funding from residents. We know that residents, well, what she said was we won't solely put the burden on residents or staff because there's a component to this with salary increases and benefits that impact staff. But in a market that's highly competitive where if we don't do what's right and, and getting in the middle and satisfying staff, we won't have them either. But what she said is that the cost, these costs will not be just, we're not just transferring additional costs to the residents. I just described two ways in which we're not making that assumption and just saying, wow, it's going to be expensive next year. We're actively looking for ways to reduce our cost. We're not simply putting the burden on residents. That was the message. But still, the funding, all the funding for ACTS even in the Samaritan Fund and everything, who else is there but the residents? 
of course. Um, however, by reducing our cost, it reduces the need to just make assumptions to add additional, right, okay. We'll split hairs later. I'll split hairs with you together after, if you'd like. thought that was a one-time thing. But we can't control the economy. You know, we can't control the economy. So, we're, but the message was clear, and I'm sharing additional information that there's a, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to be as creative as we can. And you're feeling some of those pains. I'm hearing from residents that say, I, don't, I want a printed newsletter. Well, it comes at a cost, and that's one of those controllable things. I use that as an example because I know you're feeling some of that burden now. Some of you are. So I'm going to now turn this over to Robin, who's going to share some more community-specific efforts that have helped with the cause. Thank you, George. One of the things that I've found interesting is that um, when we move into Axe and move into Edgewater, sometimes it's very easy to forget what costs are outside of here. And I'll give you a small example. My, um, to keep my air conditioning on, and I like things cold when I go to sleep, but I, I now don't reduce it as much as I like because my electric bill went from $220 to over 400. That's a big difference. It's amazing. I might have to move up north. But I do think it's a good example of how outside of here, we do get a different perspective that sometimes we lose when we move in here. And that goes from everything. Just the having the convenience of putting in a work order. And I know sometimes people get upset when it takes more than 24 hours or it's 48 hours for someone to come to your apartment to make a repair. But I can tell you I had trouble with my air conditioner and it was $160 for them to walk in my door, which didn't include the cost of repair. So I just say that so that if you look back over your own lives, the cost of what was outside um, has changed over the years. And that all the things we're talking about today are the same things that affect us outside of here, and in many ways, even more. So I just want to preface that, because I think sometimes we lose that frame of reference. And I do agree with everything that George is saying. Um, as we've addressed COVID, as we have addressed many things head on, and I believe ahead of schedule, we have been able to do a really incredible job taking care of everyone here, as well as our employees. And that makes a big difference. And we'll continue to do so. So piggybacking on some of the points made in the presentation, let me start with contract staffing. So at the height of COVID, if you recall, Willowbrook Court, and really up until the recent six months or so, we saw an incredible amount of instability. We know we lost staff. We know nurses and all staff that were working on Willowbrook Court or OBT were afraid of COVID and they didn't want to come to work. And we also lost staff because they could do several things. They could go work at the hospitals and earn an absorbent amount of money because they too were very short and it was critical as they filled with COVID. And we had some staff to leave to be travel nurses and their pay was exorbitant too. So there were things that we couldn't control or compete with. What's been interesting to see as things have leveled out a little bit more with COVID, we've seen our, some of our staff return. And that's been a wonderful thing. And I will tell you that they have come back to Edgewater because of you. It makes a difference to live here, it makes a difference to work here. 
And that is one of our biggest straws that we do have with the competition around us. But it doesn't make up for everything. So there have been regular meetings, sometimes on a weekly basis, certainly in the early stages, as we looked over every open position that we had to try to strategize. And what we've seen as a result of that is that most, but absolutely not all, of our positions have begun to be filled with staff that are coming in. We stopped with contract staffing probably past January. So unlike a lot of Axe communities, uh, most, most of them outside of our area, we were able to move agency and contract services out of Edgewater because we were able to bring in more of our permanent staffing. But despite that, it wasn't enough. And we were having people do overtime. And to this day, we have really cut back on the amount of overtime needed because we don't want to do that to our staff. We don't want them burning out. But we continue to have nursing positions to fill, and we're working hard at that. Another aspect that's really been difficult for us falls into the culinary area. That's tough because we've even seen restaurants outside of here reduce their hours be closed on certain days, close early, because of the inability to have, whether it's wait staff, somebody in the kitchen cooking, cleaning up, these are tough positions to fill. We see it a lot in culinary. We have 15 open positions with our wait staff, 15. That's such a high number. We've never been in this position before. We've always had our challenges, but never to this degree. So it does make a difference how we do treat our wait staff in the dining room and why we push so much on civil behavior, even if you're frustrated, as we try to do our very best, making sure our dining program is as best as it can be because we know how important it is. As we said, we've looked at the wording of our ads because think of this, which job would you like to apply to? Cook needed, hours, seven to 11, versus come work in a beautiful gated-like community. Have hours like you've never had before. Be able to be with your family and enjoy life after 9 p.m. Would you want to apply to the first one or the second? So even things that seem as simple as that make a difference because we need to find a way to differentiate ourselves from the hundred of restaurants in our area that are doing the same thing. We want to make it a good reason to apply here. And even with those changes, we're still short in our kitchens. There are times you don't see Darren because Darren is in the kitchen cooking, as opposed to being able to be a director and have broader oversight. I've volunteered in the kitchen. I do preface it by saying I'm very good at scrambled eggs. They have not taken me up on the offer, and I'm still a little bit confused by that. But to George's point, it's why we do have the buffets. And we don't do them often. We prefer not to. But you know, just recently, we had more than five days of buffet. And that's directly related to the number of wait staff we have to be able to bring your dinners to your table. And when we can't do that, we then need to resort to the buffet. And we do that to make it as beautiful as we can. And I know yesterday, 
went very, very well and was absolutely delicious with the breakfast that we had. And I hope everybody was able to enjoy it. So looking to be competitive. We will never pay the highest wages, but we will pay competitive wages in specifically in positions that are hard to fill. And what's been done is that our bulk of market is going to be different than up in Pennsylvania area. So what ACTS does for us is a competitive analysis that's specific to the Boca Raton area. Because we want to make sure that what we're paying as an hourly rate does compete with the restaurants that are out there. And we always are able to help with work-life balance. That makes a difference, too. And while we've been going over this, I can say that our retention rate has remained strong. It's gotten stronger as we've leveled out through COVID till we are now. We have positions that have remained very strong, such as environmental, maintenance. We do struggle with security. But the nursing teams, to include our CNAs, our dietary aides, and you can think of a dietary aide the same way you think of our wait staff. That's just the name we use for Willowbrook Court and OBT. Those are positions that are challenged. And what we used to do, now I have to say what we used to do back in the day, was that we would always have a pool of CNAs or nurses so that if someone did need to call off, if somebody was on vacation, if they had a child sick and couldn't go to work, we would have a group of people that we were able to call to be able to come in. We don't have that anymore. So it is our directors and managers in OBT and Willowbrook Court that are working those shifts. And Becky's in the back of the room right now. And I know she was impacted most recently. So people who were able to focus on big picture and help with scheduling and where programs are going and the changes we want to make particularly during the height of COVID, needed to be on befores, making sure we were providing good care. So we have seen a reduction in that, but it still continues and is going to continue for some time. That being said, we have had a lower turnover rate, which is wonderful. Um, so, and then in regard to the capital planning, and I'll wrap things up for questions. I do want to say we relook at the capital planning all the time. I do want to reassure you that the plans that we have for this year will go unchanged. And by that, very soon, if not tomorrow, you'll see work beginning in Building A. So the project of painting, recarpering, carpeting, uh, and looking at the residential lobby will still occur. And that's our commitment to you. We do know with the recent talks, with all the challenges that we've had with Wi-Fi and internet, that ACTS has made a big commitment to us. And we already have boots on the ground that are helping us with the WAPs. That's one right there, Gerald over your head that are being upgraded to see the benefits that will give to signal strength. And there's a commitment where it doesn't to make sure we're addressing it. And that was 248 replacements. So that as we look ahead and need to make sure we're making good decisions and being conservative, the same way you would do in your own home. If there are things you can postpone, you want to do that. If something becomes more urgent, you're going to take care of that. But I do want you to know that for this year, the commitments that have made, are we are sticking with. And with that, 
Let me see if there's any questions for George and I. My name is Sally Davis, and I'm going on my 17th year at Edgewater. Have to say I like it. But I will say that my move-in fee 17 years ago, do you think it's ever gone up or down? It's gone up. It's gone down for several years during the recession. And whereas my maintenance fee when I came in, Tell you. barely over $2,000. It has gone up every year by a percentage, but I paid a move-in fee of almost $300,000 when I moved in to move into a two-bedroom, two-bath, 280, I believe, to be exact. Now, why? That's where our capital Funds come from, as I understand it, our capital funds have to be spent differently from our maintenance funds. Is that true? Our entrance deposits make a huge difference. And Dahlia's in the back of the room. And I think we can say, come on up, with pretty good certainty, Sally, that those entrance deposits have not gone down. Yeah, I would. Uh, yes, they've gone up. Well, you know, I can, I can speak to this. I would ask if, I, I, I doubt your assumption about your fee. That being said, there are different programs that we have to promote sales. An example is an as-is apartment. So right now we have a special, if you will, for an as-is apartment. So you move in, you take it as it is, no questions asked, here's the price it is likely less than uh, an apartment that we would need to spend a lot of money on in order to prepare. But I would, uh, privately, uh, if you have that assumption, I think we can clear that up for you and let you know. I mean, we have records to show what your fees were, um, but I, I, in 17 years, that's not likely because every year we also do adjust the, the cost involved with apartment renovations. You're correct on your assumption about how fees are utilized, that a large portion of, of your fees when you move in for that unit, it's not a real estate purchase, but it's prepaid health care for you, a good portion. We utilize those often for um, projects, you know, for our, our, our um, capital projects. That's true. That's true. But we can't manipulate the market. Like, if we can't move a unit, we can't get a new prospect to come in, we have to be creative. So we have a lot of special ways to be creative, but costs have increased over the years. Costs for us have increased, cost of just maintaining real estate has increased, and with that comes increase in cost for the life care contract, as well as monthly maintenance fees. Another thing, just to add on to that, there's five different plans. So when you start to talk to residents and they tell you, I paid 200 for my apartment and you paid 300, you also have to look at the bigger picture, what plan they're under, whether it's the premier plan or if it's asset preservation, where they're preserving their assets so they pay a higher monthly maintenance than you do. So there's other things that we should consider as well. Any other questions before we wrap up? I understand the need for you to do the things to keep the community going, but it's coming across to me as lack of sensitivity for the residents on many levels. And I'm not talking just financially. Okay, yesterday was the highest holy day for Jewish people. There is a very large population here. Why wasn't construction told to keep the banging at a minimum. I mean, I'm in my apartment, I'm fasting, I'm observing the holiday, and I have to listen to that drilling and banging for hours. And I think something should have been said. Another thing that I have a concern about is if you get a very late reservation, 
in the dining room, they run out of food. They don't have the chicken, they don't have the dessert. To me, that's unacceptable. So let me address the second part. You know, Darren, and I think the new system that we have uh, when you place your order helps us a great deal. Number one, we never want to run out of anything. And I do think on rare occasions that has occurred. However, the difference is now is that with the new system that we're using to order, that gets tied directly to inventory and helps us understand how much a certain chicken, many people ordered it, so that when it comes to purchasing food and looking at the menu, we have a good understanding of quantity. In regards to the banking? Yeah, can I speak to that? I have to share that, that Robin's a, a very big supporter and has spoken very directly about being cautious and sensitive at Edgewater with regards to, to Jewish holidays and High Holy Day. Um, unfortunately, it, you know, her energies haven't gotten to a point, and I promise you they will as we go into the holidays even, and even further. I know that's the highest holiday, but, but we need to, we need to collaborate on how to communicate that through the chains. You know, that being said, you know, it, there's a lot of energy to finish apartments to get residents in before the end of the year, but but can we can we be sensitive on those special days? The answer is exactly won't yeah. No, I I can't disagree that we can do a better job of of being sensitive to that. We're going to take one more question. We've been our hour here and have a a lot of hungry people. <clears throat> Elliot Rapp Rappaport. Uh, this isn't a question, but it certainly is a uh, something in my background that indicates it's an area for cost saving. Uh, I'm involved in the in the construction industry. The whole concept of having to wait the ex uh, such a long period of time to renovate an apartment uh, to me is uh, unacceptable. I understand that there have been some uh, supply issues, uh, the windows that, uh, that didn't come in or, or some of the appliances, uh, but I think that uh, that's an area where I think you should put some additional effort in trying to uh, reduce considerably the amount of time of construction. And Elliot, I can just say, and George can uh, add to it, this has been an area that we have been heavily, heavily focused on because we know the time frame makes a difference. I want to add, I'll, and I'll use your example, Windows. Our contractor has at, proactively, on their own accord, on their own dime, purchased Windows in advance of getting a permit, of getting the job, so that they would have them on site. So I would say, Mr. Rappaport, that I'm sensitive to your concern but what you don't know, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. There are, we had a meeting yesterday, an hour and a half meeting with a whole collective maintenance project or the um, apartment restoration team, focusing again on what we can do to cut the time that it takes. It's complicated and we don't control all aspects, but our vendors are even on the same page with us to try their best to get um, the supplies they need to have stocking them. We did a, a recent project at Indian River County that's underway now. The vendor, before they started and before they actually gotten draws on equipment, had the roofing materials um, supplied ahead of time. They had all the stock. They built the stockpiles because they know of the challenges. All of our vendors have that conversation and, and have those efforts. It's a nice thing about having the relationship we do with them. There's, there's trust, um, but Complete Property does buy windows in advance and stock them so that they can not have that particular area as a delay. Does it always work? No, there's always that strange window <laughs> in that corner that's a little different. You know, if you're in construction, there, it doesn't always work, but you make your best effort. But, but point well made, and it's an area that we continually have dialogue about on how to shorten that time. Palm Beach County for acts is the longest for apartment renovations, and most of it has to do with the county and then the city of Boca Raton for St. Andrew's Estates, very complex. And Delia has a comment as well. Yeah. And then we'll close on this remark. 
I also want to say labor issues play a role in this as, as well. Delia, did, you can speak to it if you'd like. But that's what we find. When we talk about labor shortages, that's an area that's deeply affected. So we need to figure out, and it's difficult, how do you get full crews? How do you get more people to be doing the work itself? I want to thank everyone for being here. George, I'm so glad that you were here today. I thank you. And if you have individual questions, we can talk after this. But I hope everybody has a very good day. Thank you.